I'm very honoured to have the opportunity to interview Roger Heath-Brown and I'd like to start just by recalling a, a comment I made at your 60th birthday conference actually, which is um, that I first heard about Roger Heath-Brown when I was uh, 15. And that's because I, I bought this book, it was my first mathematics book, Unsolved Problems in Number Theory by Richard Guy. And it's a, it's a book with lots of beautiful problems in, in number theory and a 15 year old can get something from it even if they don't really understand all of the details behind it. And Roger is mentioned, uh, I think, 25 times in, in that book. So as a 15 year old, I had the impression that uh, the way mathematics worked was that Paul Erdős posed problems and Roger Heath Brown solved those problems. <laughs> so not much has changed since then about my uh, impressions of Roger. Um, but um, maybe we could go back uh, then right to the beginning of your life and, and ask a few questions about mm -hmm. your early life. So can you tell us a few things about where you grew up and um, how yeah. you developed an interest in, in mathematics? Um, I was brought up in Welling Garden City. Um, I went to local primary school, secondary school, grammar school. Um, my, my father was a research chemist, um, a very scientifically literate, but not a mathematician as such. And I think my first real exciting exposure to mathematics came from looking at a book that my dad had, um, Problems by Dudeney. Oh, yes. Um, and some of those have a distinct number theoretic nature. I remember one of them requiring one to factorise the number 1111111, which of course I couldn't do, um, and various other things. I think something involving Fermat's little theorem. Oh, yes. Um, and the book had some references, which as I grew older I took up. Um, I think one was maybe Oyston Orr's book. On so this is when you were still at, at secondary school, is it? Or yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and I chased up references there. I had um, a very good public library system. I got a hold of Hardy and Wright, um, various other books. Um, and uh, Esterman's book on what was then called modern prime number theory, right. I think, written in the 1930s. <laughs> um, and did you have teachers at school that, uh, that were encouraging this, or um, was this mo mostly sort of... Well, independent I think, you know, theory? by the time I was 16 or so, I was a number theorist. They were encouraging me in mathematics in general. Um, I remember... Um, my applied maths teacher um, gave me access to all his past mathematical gazettes. Uh -huh. I remember um, one or two problems that I think I asked my pure maths teacher who explained Fermat's little theorem. Um, but um, yeah, they were they were keen to coach me in mathematics in general, which was probably good for me because I was doing yeah. too much number theory at the time. So, I mean, nowadays a student like you would almost certainly be involved in the Olympiad and mm. things like that. Would, did that, that not didn't come happen, to your school? No. Um, and it was a decent grammar school and we had you know, a couple of people going to Oxbridge a year, but it wasn't a, a, one of the major players in the game. Right. And I think that was probably those sort of systems, such as they were, would have been restricted to to independence. That's, at yeah, the time. somehow the impression I have. I think, or um, well maybe the first time Britain sent a team to the Olympiad was 1967, so that would have, that was, yeah, was, you were, what, 14 Yeah, I, I, I point, went so. up to Cambridge in 69. Yeah, so it wasn't becoming a, a widespread Seven, thing until yeah. a bit later. Yeah. So from what you've said, it, I mean, it sounds like a natural decision to study maths at, at university. Um, Absolutely. Um, I think, you know, when I was 13 or 14, I might have been a chemist like my father, but from then it was maths only. And uh, like me, some number of years later, you went to Trinity College. Yep. Is that, how, how did you hear about Trinity as, as a place to um, go? My applied maths teacher just assumed if I was a good mathematician, I ought to go to Trinity. To go there. Um, yeah. I had no say in it really. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know any better. <laughs> um, now, so while you were at Trinity, um, I understand that you had a supervision partner who uh, yeah. has subsequently gone on to distinction in, in other yes. areas. Can um, you tell us about that? So this must have been in my third year, possibly. Um, so I, my first supervision partner ended up 
I th- maybe he got a third. Or it may have been a special all through. Mm-hmm. Um, he but was I was intimidated by you. <laughs> possibly. <laughs> I was rapidly moved on. So yes, in my second and third year, I was um, paired up with Sheng Lung Li, um, who is now, or has been for many years, Prime Minister in Singapore. Um, and the story is that in um, part to in, tri- in the tripos, he was uh, beat the person who was in second place by enough marks to give anyone else a decent 2-1. Um, was that person you? I don't know. Oh. I may be even further <laughs> down the list. Um, I was in the same year as uh, Bernie Silverman, okay. who also did extremely well. Um, don't actually know that I've kept up with any of that year. Um, yes. Um, so, well, after that undergraduate mm-hmm. career, you made the decision to stay at Trinity and, and do a PhD with yes. Alan Baker. Well, of course, I did part three. Well, yes. Um, so. Again, that didn't seem to be much of a decision. It just happened no. automatically. The, um, I had no fallback position. Uh, I just somehow assumed that I would automatically go on to get a, a grant to do to do research, and that they would take me. And fortunately, they did. Yeah. And what made you decide to work with Alan in particular? Was he the person whose interests were? He just won the Fields Medal at that time, I suppose. I wasn't mm. interested in his research. Um, I wanted <laughs> did, to did, you, <laughs> did you make that clear to him when you asked whether? I think it was pretty clear. Work? Yes, uh-huh, um, he was happy to take me on on those terms. Right. Um, I wanted to do, I mean, I had seen Hugh Montgomery's thesis, his lecture notes, yeah. multiplicative number theory, and that was clearly the thing for me. Um, did you, was he, Hugh Montgomery, was, um, he, he was at Trinity ju- as well, did he overlap uh, he, with you at that time? No, he didn't. Um, he must have, I, I never even met him as, oh. uh, until he came back later. He must have left a couple of years before me. Martin Huxley had left. Um, there was no one working in multiplicative number theory as such. Um, Paddy Patterson possibly was the closest. Um, but that's really rather different from what I was doing. Yeah, it was very brave of Alan to, to take yes. someone on, I yes. think, who was not going to work in the same area as yeah. um, Well, I may return, I'm going to return in a little bit to actually the nature of that mm. PhD, but I came across a fact which I didn't know before whilst researching this interview, which is that your first paper was with a gentleman, somebody that can only be described as a gentleman mathematician, going by the name of Cecil John Alvin uh, Evelyn. Yes. Who listed his address story. as the St. James's Club, London, or something of that nature. Right. <laughs> can you tell us how this collaboration came to be? <laughs> yes. Um, I guess this was during my first year as an undergraduate. Um, my applied maths teacher from school, noticed uh, an advertisement in the, in the Times saying uh, mathematical secretary wanted, um, I think it might have mentioned the Louisville function, mm-hmm. uh, which I had vaguely heard of. Um, and so CJ Evelyn had been a student of Hardy's, um, has one well-known paper with with Heilbronn, I believe. Um, so his, his name does occasionally occur in the, in the literature from the yeah. 1930s. Yeah. Um, he was definitely a gentleman, had gone on to manage the family estates, and now in his 60s or so, came back to mathematics and was writing highly elementary papers about identities between arithmetic functions and wanted someone to help write them up for him. I see. It sounds like a dream job. I don't think well, so. um, it paid well. Yes. Um, I immediately realised that the mathematics was not at the level that I'd been hoping for, um, but he was paying me um, and he insisted that my name go on the papers. I suspect that it was only the fact that he donated sums of money or books, I believe, to the London Mathematical Society that persuaded them to publish his papers, but they were published. Um, and that was where my first paper came from. Okay. Yes. Um, so to return to your thesis work, I mm. mean, I've noticed looking at maths I know, I mean, starting in about 1978, basically a, a torrent of papers issues forth mm. from Roger Heath Brown at the rate of several a year. Um, did you hit the ground running in, in your first year? Were you suddenly proving results straight away? Yes, I, 
I think so. I mean, I, as I say, I, I got hold of Montgomery's lecture notes um, as an undergraduate. I'd read particularly his stuff on zero density theorems and Alan Baker, well, what does a, a supervisor do? Um, you know, they see a theorem and they say, OK, generalise this to algebraic number fields. So that was my first problem. And so I generalised the zero density stuff to algebraic number fields and all that. Pretty straightforward, really. Um, and it got a little bit interesting where Artinel functions came in. I had to learn a little bit about that. But and he didn't try and get you interested in transcendence no, theory? Not at not all. At That's all. quite interesting. No. Okay. Um, strange, because I, I know, eventually I did some work that um, many, many years later that was based on transcendence. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask a bit about that. Grateful later, that actually. I actually learned yeah. something at the time. Well, actually, maybe we can talk about that now in case mm. I, I forget. So this is, I guess, your work on Heilbronn's exponential yes, sum and things. Yes. So was that something that had those ideas been gestating since your thesis Not days? Not the slightest, or just sort of no. So, well, it's taking us many years on, you know, um, at the start of every academic year, Brian Birch would give a, a seminar on open problems, and every year the problem of Heilbronn's exponential sum would come right. up, and every year I would attempt it, and every year I would fail, pretty much at the same point. <laughs> um, and then one year... Um, so maybe c can you tell us what Halbron's exponential sum sure, is? Sure, um, it's the exponential sum where the variable n goes from one to a, to p, p is prime, um, and the exponent is two pi i times n to the power p over p squared. Mm -hmm. So that makes it first of all very high degree p rather than a constant degree, and it looks like a, a sum mod p squared. So yeah. both those factors make it diff difficult. Um, and people had written about attempts to estimate this using Bayes bounds, and where you get a, a bound that is worse than trivial. Right. Yeah. Um, and then it must have been presumably sometime, you know, early one Michaelmas term, relatively soon after the problem session, that Graham Everest came and was giving some lectures on, or gave us a seminar on um, Mahler measures completely unrelated, and he mentioned the result of Dobrovolsky, which I remember Brian Bur uh, uh, Alan Baker talking about, and I thought it would be fun to go back and uh, look at the proof and maybe improve on Dobrovolsky's result, which of course I didn't manage to do, and that made me think about the transcendence method, auxiliary polynomials, and suddenly the two came together, um, and I realised that the problem that I'd wanted um, in connection with uh, the Heilbronn sum might be attacked by means of the um, auxiliary polynomial method from transcendence. Yes, it's remarkable when this happens in, in mathematics. It sort of happened to me a few times as well. Yeah. When you sort of you've got some problem you've thought about for ages, and then something else totally different comes yes. along. Has, has, has that happened on other occasions? In um, that must be the, the clearest example. Um, I mean. Not, not a problem that I've come back to again and again and again. So, um, you know, the problem on the uh, Kummer's problem on cubic Gauss sums, right. for example, was one where um, a method from what appeared to be a completely different area came along just at the right moment for me. Um, and I was able to apply that to cubic Gauss sums. Was that, work, was that with Patterson? That, that well, again. Uh, every year, well, not every year, but you know, two or three times, Patterson had given us an update on where he was on cubic Gauss sums. Right. Um, and so I was well aware of what his methods were capable of doing. And just at the right moment, I l learnt about um, the Vaughan identity and how it could be used for um, sums over primes which were not involving a multiplicative function, something which was specifically non-multiplicative. Mm -hmm. I knew enough about cubic Gauss sums to realise that they had this twisted multiplicativity property. Right. Um, and that was enough to solve the problem, um, given quite a lot of help from Patterson on his stuff. Um, so to continue talking about somehow your, your earlier research career, um, there's quite a lot of famous results from that time. Um, I, let me mention a few There's sort of a result. Well, uh, results that lots of people know, like, for example, the smallest prime in an arithmetic progression mod Q is at most Q to the 5.5, mm. that there are infinitely many twin primes if there's a C equals zero. 
And then that Fermat's last theorem holds for, quotes, 100% of experiments. <laughs> yes. Now, I'm guessing that you're probably quite pleased with the first two of those and, and think of the third as, uh, as not fun. one of your uh, no, that's greatest not, things. No, that's not one of my greatest, no. Um, well, but I, I, I don't disown it in any way. No. Um, I was going to ask, though, what, I mean, what do you think? For, from that period up to about n mid, the mid-1990s, what, what do you think of as your best yes. pieces of work at um, that time? Possibly the 12th power moment for the Riemann mm -hmm. zeta function. Um, that's still something that I come back to every now and so then. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about so what that result is? One has estimates for the size of the Riemann zeta function on the critical line. Um, that at height t it will be at most uh, of order t to the one sixth or a little bit smaller. Yeah. Um, and the twelfth power moment concerns the average of the twelfth power of the zeta function. And because it, as far as we know, could be almost as large as t to the one sixth, then the twelfth power could be as large as t squared. Yeah near enough. And my result shows that this happens at most once or not much more. Um, of course, I mean, if we assume the Riemann hypothesis, it's then going then to it be much smaller. It's much smaller. Mm -hmm. But the, in some senses, this is the most powerful result we have on very large values of the zeta function. And indeed, it includes um, the pointwise bound. You can deduce the L infinity bound from this L12 bound. So what is it about that result that... Um, that I like. That you like the most, yeah. I mean, is that um, what, what techniques... Well, I suppose, first of all, it was um, very early on in my career. Um, before I... Before I... Uh, certainly before I came to Oxford. Um, there was a surprise element in it. That's always what one likes. Um, and there were a number of useful corollaries, uh, results about the generalised divisor problem, for example. Mm -hmm. um, now, something else that I guess must have come from that period is um, what's now known as Heath Brown's identity. And I should say that, yeah. I mean, Heath Brown's identity is a it's a quite a technical thing to state, but it was used, for example, by Zhang in his work on um, yes. his famous recent yes. work on small gaps between primes. So, can you tell us about how that identity came about? Yes. Um, so, Vaughan's identity was the big thing um, at the time I was completing my doctorate. Um, it was a beautiful way of handling sums over prime numbers. And it seemed to me that there were certain rather specialised situations where one might want to iterate it. And so I iterated it once, and there was one application where this gave a better result. Um, and that when you write down the, the, this iteration, it looks disgusting. Um, but the so-called Heath-Brown identity puts this on a much more straightforward footing and allows one to, in effect, iterate the Vaughan identity as many times yes, as one wants. Yes, I was going to say, I never saw And you get a much better understanding of how the primes, how to break up the, the, the sum over primes. Right. Um, but it is basically a special form of the binomial theorem. It doesn't seem yeah, very well, grand when one looks at it that way. Doing, of course, one has to think that such a thing should be out there. But, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and well, I, of course, I was familiar with... Which paper did I... So this was in the uh, Canadian Math Journal of the Canadian Mathematical Society. It must have been the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and it was applied there, I forget what, what the application was. Um, a, I don't know, a new, a new proof of Huxley's theorem on gaps between primes. Um, yeah, I, it, it, it compared with the Vinogradov version, which, in, in a sense, is just as powerful, it's so much easier to use. Yeah. That's why everyone likes it. So after your PhD, you took a research fellowship at Trinity mm -hmm. College. Um, so it was looking possibly as if you were going to just stay at Trinity forever. But then yes. you, you, you moved in 1979 to Magdalen. Yes. Um, can you explain... How that came about? Yes, how that came um, about. There were two factors. Um, 
I just split up with my girlfriend at the time. I felt it was you know, good to move. And Brian Birch um, said there was a post coming up at Oxford. And why didn't I apply? Um, I find it difficult to refuse any suggestion from Brian. Um, I was probably under the um, false impression that if he suggested I should apply, then I was almost certain to get the post. Uh -huh. Um, but I was lucky and, uh, and did, yeah. And I assume that, I mean, I, I don't know a huge amount about the teaching system at Oxford, particularly historically, but I gather that at that time the teaching load was quite substantial, is that right? Um, by today's standards, yes. Um, it didn't seem substantial to me at the time. So how much? How I much? was scheduled to do 12 hours of tutorial teaching per week for you know, the eight weeks of term. Which, of course, with preparation and marking is... Uh, Sounds which like is a full-time job, essentially. Um, plus one 16 lecture course per year. Yeah. So did this not impact on your research in an adverse...? Not in the slightest. Really? Well, <laughs> I just split up with my girlfriend. I didn't have a girlfriend. See, so that yeah. <laughs> gives a lot of spare time. I lived in college. I didn't have to prepare any meals. Um, Maudlin never seemed to have a full complement of students. I don't know that I ever really did 12 hours of teaching per, per week. Um. Seems to me nowadays, um, you know, the, the best young mathematicians often get fellowships like mm. Royal Society fellowships or EPSRC type Absolutely. fellowships where they basically don't do any teaching until they're 30 or, or more. Were these things not so available in those days? Um, I never heard of such a thing um, until such time as I thought these were for younger people, and mm. I was past. I was you know, no longer eligible. Almost, um, you know, I suppose I could have applied for a Royal Society professorship, for example, but I didn't feel the need for it. I had enough time for research. So, I mean, I've found in my career more than once that teaching, especially lecturing a graduate course, has actually been directly helpful to my mm. research. Um, have you have you found that to be the case, um, or are you somewhat neutral on it? I'm. Pretty neutral, but I have one good example, um, which is just an example. Um, I guess it was probably a problem that Brian Birch set for the elementary number theory course about Fermat's last theorem, uh, prove Fermat's, the, the first case of Fermat's last theorem for exponent 5. This was long before Wiles, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, and Remind me what the first case of Fermat... Because uh, now Fermat's oh, last no, theorem... No, one wouldn't know. This, so only, this is Fermat's last case. theorem in variables um, x to the p plus y to the p equals z to the p in variables which are not divisible by p. Right. And there are, there's more than one elementary method to show that um, if the exponent p is 5, then at least one of the variables must be a multiple of 5. Um, I probably didn't find the slick solution that Brian had in mind, but um, I... You know, presented the proof via Sophie Germain primes. And this got me thinking about Sophie Germain primes. And I produced an argument that would show that the first case of Fermat's last theorem was true for infinitely many prime exponents, providing one had some good information about the largest prime factor of p minus 1. So I guess, from my memory, there has so it wasn't known to be true for infinitely many exponents p, yeah. although that would have no. been the case had one known that there were infinitely many Sophie Germain primes. That That's right. right. Which is a prime p a for famous which prime, open questioning prime. Yes. yes. And a Sophie Germain prime is a prime p for which two p plus one is also a prime. Uh, that's right, and yeah. it's, it's it's that way round. So uh, we use the fact that eleven is also prime yeah. to handle the exponent p equals five. Right. So that wasn't known. That was not known, and what I required was something weaker than that. Yeah. Um, which was just out of reach. Um, and I think that Brian was going to a conference in New York about Fermat's last theorem, probably connected with, um, with elliptic curves, and decided to give a talk on, on my conditional result. Um, Andrew and Lisko was in the audience, for example. People knew about this, because it never got published, because it was all just a conditional result. Um, and a few years later, 
Len Edelman rediscovered a somewhat weaker version of this, publicised it, uh, Fouvry got to hear about it, was eventually able to prove the, uh, the result about uh, approximate Sophie Germain primes, and the result was a pair of papers in Inventionis. One, one is my joint paper with Len Edelman on uh, establishing the criterion, and, and Fouvre is proving the result about. So this, these, I didn't know about this. So th this together gives infinitely sort of many, infinitely many cases of Fermat's yeah. last theorem. This was at the with time much an extremely proof. weak, yeah. but the strongest yeah. result known on, and still Fouvre. presumably much easier for. A lay person to... Well, for an analytic make. number theorist, certainly, yes. Although, does it require sort of deep... Um, a lot of Civ theory and uh, the bombieri Vinogradov theorem, things okay. of that depth. Right. Good. Um, now, I noticed looking through your papers that it seems to me that around the mid-1990s, your research took a somewhat different direction when you started getting interested in problems with more of an algebra ah, geometric flavour. Yes. And I'd say that since then, more than half of your papers yes. have been in that direction. So can you tell us a bit about how, how that direction started off? Well, I suppose I could think of it as being Brian Birch's influence, of course. But I suspect, in fact, and I've always felt that I was influenced most of all by Davenport, um, even though I never met him. Yes, I was going to say, he died in Died 69, before I went to Cambridge. Yeah. Um, and his papers on cubic forms were a strong influence. Um, I was trying to better these. Um, and so I think the first paper in that vein was, uh, was my paper on cubic forms in 10 variables, which probably displays a distinct lack of knowledge about algebraic geometry. And over the last 20, 30 years, I have slowly become slightly less ignorant of the subject. Um, well, it's relatively un unusual for a more senior mathematician to kind of take on a completely new subject um, at that age. So well, I think that other people have been more successful. This is my one attempt at, at learning some new mathematics, uh -huh. yes. Um, and it's certainly convinced me that uh, people in the past were held back by lack of appreciation of the geometry of some of these yeah. problems. So within that sphere of work, mm. which papers of yours stand out, do you think? Um, I guess the, my two papers on cubic forms are the ones I'm most pleased mm. with, the one on 10 variables for smooth forms and 14 variables in general. Um, I mean the, they're quite different papers. One is, I think, largely elegant, not entirely, and the other is foul. <laughs> Um, which one is which? Well, the, the ten I variable pa paper is largely elegant, but has an awkward bit. The fourteen va pa variable paper is foul from end to end. Uh -huh. That's um, uh, a good recommendation. To, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Now, something else that seems to me to have changed around about the mid nineties is that prior to certainly prior to nineteen ninety, you'd only had I think one student, Graham Ringrose, yeah. or at least that's all that um, math genealogy would yes. admit to. And then I, subsequently, you've had n nearly 20. Yes. So how, how, how did does that, that change? Um, I think it, it, it's just fluke, really. I, I, I had other students than Graham Ringrose. He's the only one people have ever heard of. None of them wanted to, con almost none, wanted to continue in academic, academia. Um, I had one student who left at the end of his first year, um, you know, I had a couple who only ended up with MSc. So, uh, I know, I was perhaps not a good supervisor, it's obvious. I'd wondered whether, because I've always had the feeling that in the, in the 80s, somehow, topology and geometry were king. I mean, anyone with... No, that isn't the case? You don't maybe it's with? true. Um, no, I had... But you well, had OK. Um, Trevor Woolley applied to Oxford. Ah. Um, we decided not to make him an offer. Ah. He would have worked with okay, me. Okay, yeah. Um, I had a very good student from Singapore who had a government scholarship which required him to go and work in the civil service in Singapore after graduating, and he never got back into, into mathematics. Uh -huh. 
Um, and you're, well, it seem, I mean, it seems as if your students seem to get better with time. I mean, you, you're two I'm really quite well students now. I'm very pleased with the, the most recent ones. Um, I mean, I, I suppose starting probably with Tim Browning. Yes. Um, Lillian Pierce, I suppose, counts as a, you know, she was a student, if not a doctoral student. Um, and then the most obviously um, James Maynard. But I I'm also think that uh, Simon Myerson has a future to him. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, th um, I think that, that I know. Maybe I just give them more encouragement and um, convince them that they should stay in academia. I mean, Chris Ringrose could have done, I, I think, um, but he, he wanted to, to move off. Yes, so James Maynard is an interesting question. Um, I mean, he... I'm, I'm trying to think how I might have reacted if I'd been his advisor, and he, he might have come to me at some point and said, I want to try and prove that there are bounded gaps mm. between primes. I fear that I would have said, the best thing that I might have said would be, well, OK, think about that some of the time, but make sure you have some other problems mm. on the go at the same time. Um, how did it work with me? Well, um, I think he really started on this problem um, in, certainly in his final year, if not part way into his final year. So he already had a lot under his belt. And yeah. I felt it was quite safe for him to, Pursue a to high start risk moving on to something yeah. more high risk. Yeah. Um, and I think that there was already the germ of an idea worth exploring there. And one could see that there were, there were, there were some possibilities other people hadn't looked at. Um, and therefore, yeah, that it was worth spending some time on it. But um, obviously he didn't make the major breakthrough while he was with me. Um, you know, at the time he had he left, it didn't look like it was going anywhere much. Yes, and then, well, the and timing then, you know, was a interesting. A few weeks later he'd, he'd done it all. Yeah. Um, OK, well, I think we're coming towards the end of this. Mm. Um, I just wanted to ask a few questions about, I mean, it seems to me that analytic number theory now is in as good health as it's ever been in. There are mm, lots of great things absolutely. happening all the time, lots yes. of brilliant young people. So I assume you're not planning to retire from doing research anytime soon. No, I'm not. Um, no, I, I feel like I'm slowing down. Um, but yeah, it's so exciting. I you want to be involved and hear what's going on, um, give encouragement where one can. Are you uh, prepared to share with us any specific research objectives or, or plans um, for things to...? I've got three projects on the go at the moment in various stages. Um, none of them seem are going to be earth-shattering. Um, so um, there's well a problem that I've um, talked about a number of times already about gaps between primes. Um, I've got a, a problem um, which involves a little elementary class field theory, um, primes for which 16 divides the quadratic class number for q square root minus p. Um, and a project that I've just been thinking about with Tim Trudgeon, the student who's gone off to Australia. Yeah. Um, Enough to keep me out of out of mischief for a while, anyway. And um, some of us are of the belief that the the right sort of introduction to analytic number theory book has not been written, <laughs> um, or at least no one's done better than Davenport's book, which is mm. now fifty years old. And yes. you, you don't have any plans um, to address that state of affairs. Uh, so I don't have any plans. Um, if anything. Um, I think a nice introduction, or another nice introduction to you know, analytic methods for um, Diophantine problems mm -hmm. um, would be nice. And partly because that's uh, less written about. And there are so many books. I agree that there's no perfect introduction to analytic number theory, but there are lots of um, less than perfect alternatives. <laughs> that's um, true. And I think uh, apart from 
um, Tim Browning's book, there isn't really anything that quite covers the sort of material I'd like to see on um, an introduction mm -hmm. to analytic methods for Diophantine equations. Um, now, people have talked in the past about a book on sieve methods, but I, I, I'm such a perfectionist, I wouldn't like, want to write a book about something where I couldn't give a, an elegant, complete account. Um, but it may be that what's called for is precisely not a complete account, well, as a short yes. and incomplete account. Uh, a yeah, short, yes. Mm. Could be very useful. Mm. OK, well, finally, I, I mean, um, you know, now you don't have uh, to teach and, um, and lecture and so on, there's more time in your life. Can you tell us about anything outside of mathematics that you're going to use this yes. time for? Yes. Um, I, I, I feel I need more time for myself. Um, I have a big project in, uh, in field botany in Britain. I'm a, a, keen, a keen botanist. I'm going to be doing some recording for the Atlas 2020 project to record the flora of the British Isles as it is up to the year 2020. And I've got 100 square kilometres of East Oxfordshire to look after. That's an area approximately the size of the, the convex hull of Oxford or something, is it? Or uh, yes. So, so that well, should keep possibly you, more. Yes. Keep you busy. Uh, that, that will keep me busy for for a while yet. Right. But I'm going to be an MSRI for four months next year, and I've still got a lot of mathematics to do. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Good. Thank you.